Welcome to the stage, Dr. Alexis DeVoe and Janet Mock. So I have a story okay. about this book. Okay. That, well, that book, <laughs> this book is something else. It's, it's framed as a children's book, mm -hmm. first of all, and it's about a, a young child mm -hmm. who is dreaming of flying, mm -hmm. who, is, who, wants, who believes a bike is going to be delivered mm -hmm. based on a, her mother's welfare well check mm -hmm. coming in, and she is waiting on the streets mm -hmm. of New York City for a welfare check mm -hmm. to come. Mm -hmm. Something happens with mm -hmm. this check. And it is just, mm -hmm. I couldn't imagine how you got this book published. Huh. Uh, they, they would see it uh -huh. as uh -huh. the narrative is uh -huh. unconventional for uh -huh. a children's book. Uh -huh. But for me, I felt, uh -huh. as Kara um, said in the introduction, is the uh -huh. idea of literature, you seeing yourself in literature. You're seeing Absolutely. yourself in the pages. And I saw mm. my mother and my father's mm -hmm. welfare check. I mm -hmm. saw my childhood mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in this book. Mm -hmm. What was the journey for this book to even Well, you know, I come? think, well, thank you, Janet. And first of all, thank, we should thank everyone who's here and especially thank Kara Olich for, mm. for bringing us all together, all of, it, all of yes. us in the room. I think, um, you know, Nani, like other works that I've done, Janet, and, and thank you for this kind of archaeology, um, really tries to, it was really an attempt to look at what was not in literature and how does literature then sort of function as history for us. And this really is a, in, in many ways, a, ha, has to do with my family's history of, of having dreams as poor black people, of, of having those dreams being uh, dependent on some other reality, like a welfare check. The welfare check gets stolen, so what happens to the dream? And it kind of goes back to the Langston Hughes poem of what happens to a dream deferred, that kind of thing. But the primary concern here is how do we insert ourselves in a historical narrative around poverty, around dreams, around multiple kinds of blackness, and how do we not only survive those conditions or those um, realities, but how do we also live as a result of them? We, we were talking about this earlier, the difference between surviving and living. And we, we have a narrative around survival. It's like 300 some odd years you know, here in the so-called new world and we're surviving. But how are we not living, and I think that that's one of the things that your book also does. Your book also treats with this idea of how do I move from survival to actually defining a life, to inventing a life and having a life. And so I'm gonna throw it back to you. How, do you. how did you imagine that you were gonna be able to write something that we call a memoir, but is in many ways an historical treatment of an, of an individual in the context of community? Well, I think for me, the first, the way in which I found myself to writing this book was through the blueprints that are already written for me, mm -hmm. right? So I always learned through the library, through having access to text written by black women specifically, yes. right? Yes. Um, yes. Maya Angelou being the first one to like mm -hmm. really sh mm -hmm. sh strike me. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. The Color Purple by Alice Walker, seeing these women, these black women, writing themselves into existence gave me the audacity to then mm -hmm. go and say that mm -hmm. my own black womanhood, my womanhood, mm -hmm. my mm -hmm. trans womanhood, my black mm -hmm. trans womanhood, mm -hmm. my poor black trans womanhood mm -hmm. is worthy mm -hmm. of being recorded. Mm -hmm. Because I had seen nothing like that on my bookshelves before. Right. And so for me, it was... First, it was just really selfish. It was mm -hmm. just, mm -hmm. I deserve mm -hmm. to have these words mm -hmm. on a page and reflected back mm -hmm. to me. Mm -hmm. And then it became bigger. It became mm -hmm. more about making sure that that girl that's existing who doesn't really have access to mm -hmm. text, that's mm -hmm. for her to see herself, to be able to see herself mm -hmm. finally. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's where my own coming 
to this. And so when you talked about the the living archive, the yeah. the record, yeah. um, my whole thing is like the I remember talking to my husband about this and being like, you know, the worst that could happen is that this book mm -hmm. gets lost. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. which for me is like full circle. Mm -hmm. It gets lost, it ends up in a Goodwill, and some black girl from the future, right? <laughs> right? Some black girl from the future finds right. it, sees right. herself in it, yes. and then like gives yes. it back to me. Yes. You and know? lives in her past as mm -hmm. well as her present. Mm -hmm. Because that's one of the things too, I think that your, your work does. It sort of, it situates your journey in a past narrative around trans women trans people in a present narrative around yourself and also in a future narrative. And when we talk about the future, we're not just talking about, you know, 2050, mm -hmm. 2050 or 2230. Um, we're talking about your next breath. The future is your next breath. So the question is, how do you write yourself into your next breath? Are you and feeling me? Completely. And that's the the nearness of that yeah. um, and what's never lost on me as I do this work and I've, you know, wrote this book was the, the necessity of it, that some mm -hmm. people will not have that next breath, mm -hmm. right? You, right. Even, you even write about it in Yabo right. Right. with Jules, right. this idea of being someone that's non-conforming, their gender not really mm -hmm. completely translating mm -hmm. and falling into a construct or a box that is easily recognized and checked and verified for other people to say that I'm comfortable with you existing around here. The violence and the policing that comes with being mm -hmm. different, looking different, being other, non-conforming. Um, for me, I know that my sisters and siblings who are existing in the world, a lot of them don't leave their homes because of this idea that yeah. my next breath will lead to this, right? right? My even wanting to exist, my wanting to go get, mm -hmm. you know, food mm -hmm. or all of the things that I need to exist mm -hmm. may not happen, right? And so the future of that, right? The, fu mm -hmm. the fact that the future can also be not just surviving and living, but how am I gonna even just make it to the next mm -hmm. space? Mm -hmm. How am I gonna get there? Mm -hmm. I wanna um, kind of pick up on that and just talk about how we talk about genders mm -hmm. a little bit. And so I want to read something from, from Redefining Realness and then also something from Yabo. I believe in self-determination, autonomy, and people having the freedom to proclaim who they are and define gender for themselves. Our genders are as unique as we are. No one's definition is the same and compartmentalizing a person either as a boy or a girl based entirely on the appearance of genitalia at birth undercuts our complex life experiences. This is Janet Mock in Redefining Realness. Yeah, you could, you could clap. <laughs> And this is from Yabo, a both and I. There was no pink or blue in that room. There was no pink and blue. It was called the little room, and its occupant was referred to by a new pronoun, the child. Is the child hungry? Is the child wet? The child is beautiful, isn't the child? The parents did not say her or him, hers or his.